Now, this video might seem a little weird coming from my channel, you know, with me mostly talking about either funny retro blast ass jump and runs or kick ass fighting, fighting games, games with action missiles. But despite mainly sticking to those topics, I am also a big fan of first person shooters. And as a kid, there was no other FPS game I loved more than Blizzard Entertainment's very own team-based shooter, Overwatch. Man, I tell ya, when I saw that first trailer drop for it all the way back in 2014, I knew it was something special. I just had to get it. Pre-ordered it day one and instantly fell in love. To the point where my younger self considered it my favorite game of all time. And I'm not even kidding, I probably played it every single single day straight for the next three years. Now, even though I did have a ton of fun playing it, I knew in the back of my mind it wasn't without its issues. Mainly dubious balancing decisions and Blizzard's overall, at the time, glacial speed for putting out patches to remedy them. But even at the game's worst, balancing its most unfair, I held on. I don't know, I was just still having a good time. It wasn't until one particular day, three years after the game's launch, that I decided to stop playing. Now, I don't really remember why I decided to quit. Maybe it was because I thought the meta at the time really sucked, or I just didn't feel comfortable supporting Blizzard after hearing the gross controversies they were wrapped up in. Or, you know, maybe I just got fucking bored. Anyway, yeah, for whatever reason, I just stopped and I didn't even as much as think about the game for the next, oh Jesus, five years? God. I mean, yeah, I'd still hear little bits and pieces about the game. I mean, who could avoid hearing about Overwatch 2 and its disastrous launch with all its broken promises and new paywalls? But it wasn't until recently I started reminiscing a bit about the time I spent playing it. Those long weekends and summer breaks, playing all those old maps with all those old characters. And I also had a couple of chats with some friends who've mostly only played the sequel, and I was really interested to learn all the little things that had changed since I last played it. Hell, we talked about it so much that I actually got a bit interested in downloading it again, just to take a look at it for myself and see how it's changed. They told me the game is in a bit of a, eh, okay-ish spot, at least compared to its launch, so I figured, what the hell, how bad could it be, right? Maybe... Maybe make a video out of it too, hmm? Gotta chase that content, gotta get that money, money. So yeah, this is going to be a bit of a scattered video, mainly focusing on my thoughts and opinions on the game, coming back to it after being away for so, so long. And also just gushing about all the stupid shit I've ever wanted to say about the game since I was a little kid. I'll only really be going into the game as it is now, rather than delving too much into its past and its older issues, cause, well, I wasn't there for that. And neither will I be talking about the unfinished story mode that was promised with Overwatch 2, cause $15? Are you fucking kidding? And now, I know Overwatch 2 slander videos are a dime a dozen on here, like, guys? I'm starting to think Overwatch might not be a good video game. But hear me out, I'm gonna break the mold a little here and actually have some nice things to say about Overwatch. I promise it's in there. It's gonna be a little bit later in the video, you might have to dig a bit, but it's there, I promise. But for now, just enjoy the perspective of a man out of time. Going from Overwatch 1 to Overwatch 2, Five years later. Okay, so where to start? Well, after booting up the game for the first time in five-something-ish years and equipping all my old fancy cosmetics, why yes, those would be the limited time skins Nano Cola Diva, Lego Bastion, and the pre-order exclusive Noir Widowmaker. Oh, what's that? Oh, why yes, those RCA cables jutting out of the back of our skull do work on most modern televisions. Thank you for asking. Anyway, let's just boot into a game real quick and... Oh yeah, roll cue, I forgot. 
Man, I don't know. On one hand, I hate how fucking long queue times can be for certain roles or just getting into a game and fucking general. I mean, come on, man. I just want to fuck around on some quick play. I don't want to have to go through the fucking bureaucratic system. But on the other hand, I do remember some genuinely miserable matches back in Overwatch 1 where we just fucking lose because people got stuck into roles they really didn't want to play. So maybe this is better? I don't know. I can't even really remember if the queues back back then were longer or shorter than the queue times now, though I have noticed queue times are pretty quick if you're solo queuing at least, but only really in the tank role. Huh. I wonder why no one wants to play tank. Now, I'm gonna have to hit you guys with a pretty hot take. You might have to, uh, strap in for this one. 5v5 is bad. <laughs> Agree with that. If you somehow don't know or don't remember, Overwatch at its very beginning was designed to be a 6v6 game. And after they decided to actually put a limit on how many of each class you could have per team, so you didn't have six Winstons jumping around a control point at any given time, they decided to settle on a 2 2 2 format. Two DPS, two supports, and two tanks. Now, tanks have always been a bit hard to balance in the history of 6v6, leading to some unfortunate metas wrapping around the class, though I always thought that more so had to do with the way the characters themselves were balanced, rather than the fact that there were just two of them. But apparently, someone on the Overwatch team decided, hey, wouldn't it be so much easier if instead of reworking and rebalancing the tanks that are causing the issues in the first place, we just got rid of one of the tanks? despite literally everyone telling them that that's a fucking horrible idea. Yep, it's pretty universally agreed upon that the switch from 6v6 to 5v5 was one of the worst decisions they made going into Overwatch 2. It puts way too much pressure on the solo tank to perform, making them the anchor that holds the entire team together and overall most important player on each team, with whole games half the time basically being decided just on how good your tank is. And of course with that comes a good amount of power creep to make sure these guys can cover just about everything because now you don't have a second tank to pick up your slack. But of course, the tanks will still have weaknesses, and of course, some tanks will be better at fighting other specific tanks, which is where counter-swapping comes in. I mean, if tanks are the most important players on the team, and you decide to just swap to the tank that's really good against the tank you're fighting against, who the fuck else is gonna stop you? Like, okay, it's not like Overwatch never had counter swaps in it before 5v5 came around. In any kind of hero shooter, or hell, any video game with distinct character archetypes in general, you're always gonna have one character whose pros just so happen to excel at exploiting another character's cons. Shit just happens. But I've never experienced it to this miserable of a degree. Okay, okay, okay. Format aside, that isn't all that's changed with Overwatch's core gameplay, because we've also got ourselves some brand new game modes. We've got this weird area swap king of the hill thing called Flashpoint that's like, kinda cool. I'm not the biggest fan of some of these rotating points, like, I think New Junk City's starting point is a little bit ass, but I think it's fun. I especially like the frantic feel of running from point to point, trying to get set up on the next one before the enemy team can. It's a good mode. And then there's the new mode that was just introduced this season, Clash. And despite what most people say, I think it's just fine. You know, it's okay. I think the maps that come along with the game mode are relatively fun. Personally, I more so vibe with maps that come along with a game mode rather than the game mode itself. I don't know if that's just me. I've heard some people complain that these matches take forever, but personally, I haven't run into that issue. They usually just end up being a steamroll one way or the other. Though a mode I definitely don't dig is this new robot push mode, which is funny considering it was one of the big selling points of Overwatch 2. I don't know, it just feels really shitty having to run that thing back and forth between team fights. And Jesus, these maps are long and narrow. Giant ass sightlines everywhere. So yeah, the new game modes are pretty neat, though with the addition of all these new game modes, it was shocking to learn that one pretty essential game mode had actually been removed from the game, a game mode that had been with Overwatch since the day of release. You're telling me 2CP is gone? And everyone's just fine with that. That's 
That's crazy! I thought at least a good chunk of those maps were fucking bangers, personally. It's wild, too, because most people just agree that the mode was horrible and are glad it's gone. Like, I'm the only one who kind of misses it. Was it really that bad? I, I don't remember it being that bad. Like I said before, I'm much more of a map guy than a game mode guy, so what really upset me wasn't the loss of 2CP as a game mode, but the loss of all the maps that came exclusively to that game mode. I like them a lot. Like, man, these were some real fucking classics. I mean, hell, two of them, Temple of Anubis and Hanamura, were the first two maps ever shown in the first ever gameplay trailer for Overwatch. So it's just weird that maps with such rich history just can't be played officially anymore. And it's not even just for the history, I just thought these maps had a lot of things I liked in them. Like Hanamura with its big ass gate on the first point, getting through that thing was always hell, but finally breaking through and taking that point always felt awesome. And on the opposite end, I always loved how massive the second point felt, all this big wide open space, especially with the massive flank on the side of the map. Anubis is a bit of a different story. That map is just tiny all around. From the cramped first push through the city streets to the ultra cramped final point with its trenches and twists and turns. The map had a fun bit of verticality to it though. With its tiny high up platforms and flank routes only accessible for heroes with aerial mobility. And other than the overall design of these maps, they also just had a lot of fun little things that I just loved about them. Like this weird flank on the stairwell on Hanamura. Or the floating conveyor belt platforms of Volskaya Industries. Like, okay yeah, these maps are probably super outdated and would definitely need some massive tweaks to work properly in Overwatch 2, especially with it all being based around a mode that apparently wasn't even good to begin with, but it's weird they didn't go through the extra effort of salvaging them. I mean, even for a downright shitty map like Horizon Lunar Colony, a map universally panned across the board. But you know, when that shit dropped, it was exciting, and the map was kind of fun for maybe like the first three weeks it was released. It was a cool looking map with a cool theme and probably had the most amount of details crammed into an Overwatch map at the time. And it's just a shame to see it all abandoned after clearly a lot of hard work was put into it. It's just kind of sad. But, on the topic of old Overwatch 1 things that had a lot of effort poured into them that have been more or less cast to the wayside, god damn do I miss old Overwatch 1 events. I swear, they just did not miss with the events in Overwatch 1, it was just banger after banger. Starting with the Summer Games event coming with fucking Lucio Ball, an instant classic. Halloween was always hype with awesome skins and Halloween versions of maps as well as Junkenstein's Revenge. Christmas was a little bit of the same story with Christmas versions of maps, but managed to experiment a bit more with its game modes. And I don't even need to tell you about the Archives event, I mean just holy fuck. And the Lunar New Year event brought Capture the Flag, and that mode was really fucking terrible, but fuck, I still played it. And if you missed any of the cool stuff from the year, there was no worries, because at the end, you had the anniversary event, where every cosmetic and mode was available, and you can play literally whatever you wanted, whenever you want. It was awesome. Though, if I'm being honest, as great as they were, after a while it did get kinda boring when they just roll out the same old events and only slightly tweak them each and every single year. And to actually give Overwatch 2 a point in its favor, they've definitely gotten a lot more creative with their in-game events. Just looking back on the seasons I missed out on, they have absolutely raised the bar with cool-ass seasons based around things like mirrored and evil alternate realities, Greek mythology, and a fucking Super Sentai battle pass that looked really fucking awesome. I'm actually a little upset I missed out on this. And they'll even do little mini-events in the middle of each season too, sometimes running multiple of them at the same time. Two of which that I've experienced so far being some of the old events from Overwatch 1, so they're even bringing those back. So yeah, this is sounding pretty good. What's the problem? The problem is, though these modes are pretty cool, they still just 
kind of feel tacked on. Not in the sense that they're low quality or anything. I mean, there's clearly been a lot of work put into these, but it's just that there's no real reason to play them. Like, yeah, they're cute and they're fun, except when they're kind of shitty, but what am I working towards? I don't really get anything out of playing these extra event modes. A new event drops and you play them for what? Battle pass points? A shitty name tag or profile card thing you'll never use? As said before, the reuse of themes back in Overwatch 1 got stale fast, but they always delivered when it came to shit to work for, you know? Despite regularly rerunning the older events, they've stopped doing the cute all-class unlockables like seasonal sprays and victory poses. Even the fucking awesome dance emotes that came every anniversary, they just don't do that shit anymore. And even something as obvious to implement, such as achievement sprays, are weirdly missing. It's just such a simple way to inject any sort of replayability or interest into these modes, and they're just not here. I remember grinding for hours to beat Junkenstein with 5 stars and no damage on the door, or getting those 4 perfect kills in a row in May's snowball fight. I mean, maybe that was just because I was a kid who actually cared about achievements back then, but you know, it was a reason to play the game modes outside of some useless knickknacks or battle pass progression. Also, I might not just be as interested in these modes because they are mostly PvP and not PvE. What can I say? Archives mode spoiled me. Man, wouldn't it be cool if they made an Overwatch game that was entirely PvE? Oh, right. But yeah, actually looking at the content at the end of the day, all these seasons really give us the majority of the time is just a skin bundle to throw money at. As for the two events I actually got to experience, the anniversary event for this year was a bit better than the Overwatch 2 standard, with them actually offering skins for participating in the event. No dance emotes though, that's sad. But the weird thing was that the skins on offer weren't even made for the event or anything. They were just three random, kinda ugly skins you could just buy whenever. Makes me wonder if you'd just be shit out of luck if you already owned them. And the WoW event was literally just Oh boy, the new season is out! I can't wait to get to drop 50 fucking dollars on some dog shit skins, yes! The question mark bobble is a little bit cute though. Oh, and this video got pushed back, so I actually got to play Junkenstein's Lab. It's cute, but a little annoying, and didn't really give me any incentive to play outside of battle pass points. So I did not spend too much time with it. Bride of Junkenstein was cool though, I wish they added more playable heroes like they did with the OG Junkensteins to keep it fresh, but it's whatever. And going on from that, with us talking a bit about the point of playing these modes and actually getting something from them, I think you know where this is going. People sorta joke about this from time to time, but I'm here to say I genuinely, from the bottom of my damn heart, miss loot boxes. Loot boxes, for a while, may have absolutely overrun games with their horrible chance pools and maybe turned a generation of kids into hopeless gamblers, but, you know, for the game that really popularized that shitty trend, I'd say Overwatch somehow did it the least scummy. They were free to earn and completely free to open. You got them just by playing the game relatively regularly for every single level up, which if I recall correctly just ranged from winning 6 to 7 matches. And if you really wanted loot boxes that bad, you had even faster methods to earn extras, like weeklies in the arcade mode as well as other event specials. And if you kept getting duplicates, they'd give you coins, which you in turn could just use to outright buy any cosmetic you wanted. And maybe it was because I played the game like a fucking madman as a kid, I mean, I literally grinded character playtimes to 24 hours because I was bored, but with every event I'd walk away with pretty much every single cosmetic I wanted. And I didn't even think once about buying a loot box. Now, it wasn't perfect, just because 15 year old me had the patience to grind this shit doesn't mean most people do, and honestly, doing those weeklies in arcade mode kinda really fucking sucks sometimes. And lacking the ability to just purchase the cosmetic you really wanted and having to gamble for it probably would've fucking sucked, especially if you're one of those completionist types who have to have every single cosmetic. But as far as I was concerned, it was just a nice, passive way to earn cool shit to wear. But of course, Overwatch 2 
2 is a free-to-play game, and you know what that means. A battle pass, of course, along with a shop with skins you can only buy for real-world money. I cannot tell you how weird it is to see cosmetics I earn just through playing the video game being slapped into $20 bundles like Jesus. And I've talked about the poor completionists before, but just take a look at all the useless crap they've bloated this game with nowadays. It's crazy. Like, you know games are really trying to ring your wallet when they start putting in shit like weapon charms? And then you have fucking souvenirs? What the fuck? Who would use these? The only things you can really earn just by playing a character you like are like name plates and gamer tag things. Now, to be fair, the battle pass was cheaper than expected. Only 10 bucks, not too bad. Oh, but then you have some shit like the super battle pass for $20 with 20 free levels. Ooh, and then your ultra green maxing with the fucking ultimate battle pass bundle that has two exclusive skins you can't earn anywhere else for 40 fucking dollars. The one cool thing they introduced in this game are these mythic skins, which are basically like super skins that come with their own special effects and voice lines and animations. Some are definitely better than others, but all around I'd say these are pretty cool additions. And earning them, at least through the battle pass, isn't too bad at all. They do this kind of scummy thing where mythics are locked behind their own special currency called mythic coins that you can only earn through the battle pass, but you are guaranteed 10 mythic coins per page. And with battle passes having 8 pages and mythic skins only costing 50, that's one per season, plus a little extra. But then they do this weird thing where they have levels to them, so even if you buy them, you don't technically earn all the styles and have to just pump even more currency into them to get everything out of it. And that's not even taking into consideration trying to earn these things without the battle pass. I mean, it costs $10 just for 10 mythic coins. And reminder, you need at least 50 to own one. That's $50 for nothing but a skin. And it's not even the full version of it. And okay, I know what you're saying, but it's free to play now. They've got to get their money somehow, and yeah, I get that, but let's take a minute to compare its free to play model with its other contemporaries. Starting with the most obvious comparison we have, Fortnite, being slightly cheaper, but also offering much more in not just their battle passes, but also when they introduce new shit into the item shop, especially their big collabs, they tend to go all out with huge changes to the map and the game, and the overall theming is a lot tighter and adding challenges that upon completion actually award you with things you might actually want to fucking work for and not just weird little trinkets. And even comparing it to another system I actively dislike, like the Valve TF2 slash CSGO crate system, where you actually have to cough up money to even open crates. But you know, at least those cosmetics actually have like monetary value, they're actually worth real world money and you can sell them to possibly make more money than you spent on opening them. And with those games actually having like a marketplace where you can trade and sell your cosmetics, if all you're looking for is to dress up your little guy in a silly hat with no crazy effects, as long as they're not like super popular or anything like that, most it'll run you is only like a little over a dollar, I'm not even kidding, when a decent Overwatch skin will run you about $20 minimum. And it gets even worse when you realize that half of the decent skins on offer in the shop either A, used to be free, or B, are just fucking shitty recolors of a skin they already sold you. It just feels insulting seeing you try and sell me the same shit with a different hue. Okay, okay, okay. So the monetization system may be a little dooky, the events may be lacking in a reason to actually participate in them, and the current format may be trash, but at the end of the day, we need to talk about what's actually important. Because I don't know about you, but the reason I've stuck around for Overwatch for this long wasn't because of its game modes, its maps, or even its skins, it was because of its fun and unique 
characters. Now, everyone has their own perspective when it comes to the playable heroes of Overwatch. You know, some people prefer to just stick to playing only one or two characters, so that can kind of shape their perception on how fun or good for the game certain other heroes are. But I've always kind of prided myself on being a bit of a flex player. I like playing pretty much every single character in this game, and have gotten pretty decent with pretty much all of them, so I definitely have a lot to say about most characters in this game. Though there definitely are some characters I care more about than others, so if I don't mention them here, I probably just don't have too much of an opinion on the changes made to them. To start out simple, I found that the DPS role felt the most untouched, aside from a couple characters. The character I first latched onto when playing this game was Junkrat, so it's nice to see he's more or less just doing the same stuff he's always been doing. I've always loved playing as these lob slob type characters, just hucking bombs across the map and hoping for the best. The extra oomph they gave to his trap throw always throws me off a bit, but it's a nice change. Reaper is pretty damn good right now too. In the past, he's always felt a bit awkward and kind of struggled to get in or really do much of anything, but now you can really just be aggressive and fucking walk at people and it feels pretty damn good. Glad he's finally found his footing. Though not all my views on the DPS changes are super positive, there are a couple of DPS I've wanted to like a bit more, but just didn't really have much fun playing. I think Hanzo's charge rate change to where you have to charge your bow for longer to get the full damage from his arrows just makes him feel really clunky and awkward. And I was really excited to check out Farah and Bastion again with their kit reworks and added abilities. But goddamn, if you don't play those characters as slow and patient as humanly possible, you just get fucked up, man. If you try anything even slightly slightly risky, you just get evaporated. I'm not trying to say these characters are underpowered or weak, because definitely good Bastions and Faras do exist and they absolutely tear shit up, I'm just saying they're not really characters for me. There is one DPS character though that I actually don't play too much of myself, but really want to talk about are the changes made to Sombra. The fun police herself pops up behind you, hacks you at the absolute worst goddamn time with her ability or her ultimate, then just gets to run away like a little bitch and do it all over again. And even though I hate this new poison virus ability, great, now she can finish me off while she's running with her tail between her legs, you know, it could be worse. She could be the old Sombra. Man, I'll tell you I was so confused when I got hacked by Sombra in Overwatch 2 for the first time and my abilities got back like 0.5 seconds later. At its worst, Sombra's old hack used to last 6 whole seconds. It was insane. Oh, and that translocate ability that can only be used as a short-ranged dash? used to be able to be placed anywhere on the map for her to teleport back to at any time. It was insanity. You used to have to go off on a fucking expedition to track down whatever health pack she was stationed at, sit at that thing waiting for her to eventually teleport back, and then try and win the 1v1 as she sidesteps you on a hacked large health pack. Though if you got a teammate involved, it was kind of fun just jumping the shit out of her. Overall still annoying as hell, but she seems to be headed in a better direction. And while no DPS hero truly feels different outside of the two that got reworked, there is one across the board change that has left some DPS heroes feeling a bit strange. That change being the, for the most part, complete removal of stuns. They gutted pretty much every single major source of stun, with those types of abilities only really remaining on tank characters. Which has been a long time coming and is definitely for the best. But for a while this game without its copious amounts of stuns just didn't feel like itself playing it again all this time later. Something I do kind of miss were those scenarios where you were on the flank and you stumbled across an enemy hero with a stun, but you had an ability that lets you dodge said stun, so then it'd become a standoff of reading just when they throw it out and just narrowly dodge it to get the kill. I mean, some stuns do exist, so these scenarios still happen, it's just not as integral as I remember it being. And it especially feels a bit weird with the majority of stuns being swapped to slows, which I mean is fucking amazing for actually going up against these characters, 
Let me tell you, it feels awesome to run into a Cassidy and not immediately get insta-killed by his Flash Fan the Hammer combo. And we don't talk about the fucking war crime shit May was doing with her old phrase. But I just kind of feel like slows are overall less satisfying to actually hit. A part of me kind of wishes they'd just scrap these abilities entirely and just give these characters something new. I remember seeing something about Cassidy getting his Flash replaced with a sticky bomb thing for a while, and I always thought it looked a bit cool, but judging by how it's gone now and I hear no one lamenting its removal, I'm guessing there must have been some issues with it. Okay, but back to the actual characters. I'm also glad to see healers haven't changed too much either. Mercy's weird hop tech got integrated into her actual moveset, so that's kind of strange and makes her really annoying to kill. And TBH Zenyatta having a cooldown on his Discord orb just makes him feel very awkward and I don't very much care for playing him nowadays. But other than that, seems more or less how I left it. Which is honestly pretty great, because can I just say, I absolutely love how Overwatch does its healers. I love how instead of just being walking heal pylons that have to spend the entire game trying desperately not to be killed, Overwatch lets them actually participate in fights and gives them interesting tools to help their team with. And some of you guys are gonna be mad, but this is all exemplified by my favorite Overwatch healer, Moira. This might make me evil as fuck, but I love playing as the evil geneticist, finding that fine balance between healing and damage dealing that all supports have to deal with, but with Moira's distinct ability to get a bit risky and really push how much damage she can put out with her life-leeching primary fire. I mean, yeah, you're not invincible, I've run into many Moira players who seem to think that, but it's all about getting into those tense situations and figuring out just what kind of stupid shit you can get away with before being punished too hard. Flying in and out and around a fight with her dash and super jump tech. And when you're getting away with it, when you're bobbing and weaving with your lanky ass Naruto running hitbox, and they just can't seem to hit you quickly dodging a stun or a slow with a fade, and using its momentum to make that risky play and fling yourself into the enemy team to pick off a fleeing enemy just before they get away. It's just too fun. And I mean, come on, she's an evil androgynous with a funny accent, a David Bowie skin, and Vegeta's final flash? This character was practically made for me. On the other hand, a healer that finds themselves in a lot of fights who feels just kind of flimsy to fight with is Brig. Now, Brig has been always in a bit of a sore spot when it comes to game balance, practically destroying the game for months on end after her release, but after they managed to fix that, I feel like she landed in a pretty alright place. Maybe being a little too oppressive to Squishies with her shield bash stun and bonk combo, but you know, she could get in and brawl with the best of them. But now you really need to learn to pick your fights well because she is just so goddamn fragile now. Most of the time you just need to hang back and try and snipe with a mace to keep the healing up until you can find the absolute perfect moment to go in, or or you're just gonna get goddamn shredded. And now, last but not least, we have the most drastically changed role of them all, the tank class. Tanks back in Overwatch 1 used to feel all pretty contained, I guess is the best way to put it. Each one had their specific jobs and things that they were good at, but never felt too overtuned. And that was because you could just have two of them. You could mix and match combinations of tanks to achieve different compositions that complemented each other's strengths and weaknesses in interesting ways. But now, there is only one tank. And these specialists are now forced to do way too many jobs at once, lest they be inadequate for being the big boy of the team. Causing a lot of these tanks to become overtuned as hell compared to their original counterparts. Now you do have some that seem to have come together pretty alright with only minor changes to their kit, aside from the ridiculous health pools given to them across the board. Like Sigma's still kinda just chillin', and Winston and D.Va are better than ever with their shields and defense matrixes getting buffed up significantly. But then you have a character like Reinhardt with actual ability changes. Not only is his shield bigger, but now he has two flame charges to throw out whenever he wants instead of the one and more importantly, his charge attack, which used to be extremely committal, can now be cancelled out of. 
Now this was definitely a much needed change for the character, helping him keep up in the crazy world of solo tanking by giving him a much more consistent way to reposition himself while maintaining the scare factor Charge already had. But I do feel like a little something was lost when just giving him the ability to cancel out of it. Removing the risk of putting yourself in a bad spot or hurling yourself off a cliff kind of takes a bit of the fun out of going for those big Hail Mary charge picks. There was always something special about going for that blind charge around a corner, just hoping some unlucky sap would just waltz right into it. It had that fun balance of risk versus reward, but now there's no real risk. And Ryan players getting a pick by hurling someone off the map while themselves not going with them used to be a fun, rare thing that required really specific map knowledge and setups, but now they could just be done literally wherever. Also, with there only being one tank now, and the majority of the ones I play not having a shield, I've been forced to eat so many fucking Earth Shatters, it's not even funny. Please send help. Oh, and speaking of shield heroes, or former ones anyway, Orissa! You know, it's crazy how you can make so many changes to a character's abilities and just have them wind up feeling the exact goddamn same. Big, bulky, crazy solid damage output, and yet so annoyingly unkillable. Her new spear motif is pretty dope and fun to at least use, but I do miss the old orb tug just a little bit. It wasn't crazy strong, but you could do some silly shit like pull people off cliffs and even their own damn shields. And the old butterfly shield and power bongos, I kinda miss too. Not to fight against, mind you, god no. But just in terms of their design, they were cute. Also, it's just weird that half of Orisa's highlight intros reference moves she just can't do anymore. Oh my god, what happened to Doomfist? This guy shouldn't even be a fucking tank, he, he used to be a DPS character. Hell, he was my DPS character. I'm telling you, he was the coolest pick character ever. He was like a mid-range projectile character, where you were the projectile. Launching Reinhardt's into the air, hitting the right read on a tracer blink, finally nailing a stupid-ass double-jumping Genji with a well-placed smack. He was so awesome. But, come Overwatch 2, in a desperate bid to lessen the overwhelming numbers gap between the DPS and tank characters, someone had the bright idea to simply change a DPS character into a tank. And lo and behold, the DPS character they chose would sadly be Doomfist. I do appreciate his new mobility, and you can still kind of do the same cool stuff he used to do, only in more complicated and situational ways, but overall he just feels so much less impactful. I mean, sometimes you get those games where you completely dunk on the enemy team and feel like a doom god, but most of the time I feel like I'm more of a nuisance than a threat. Most fights I'm just sort of flopping around like an asshole and hoping my teammates can come in and clean up while I'm lightly smacking the enemy backline around, practically doing tickle damage with his Doomfist gauntlet, you know, the weapon that gave him the ability to level fucking skyscrapers. And not to mention being just saddled with the baggage that comes with being a 5v5 tank also just bogs him down, with him now having the pressures of entire game outcomes riding on him performing well, especially on what I thought was a pretty inconsistent character in the first place, as well as his newfound importance leading to many more people on the enemy team just counter-swapping to one of his many, many counters just to cheese out a win. If there's one hero change I absolutely despise, it's this one. And to be honest, after seeing what they did to Doom, I was really fucking scared of what they would have done to Roadhog. And actually kind of avoided playing him for a while, just out of fear that he was ruined forever. But honestly, coming back to him, he feels really good. What really surprised me was his new trap ability. I wound up loving that thing a lot more than I thought I would. I like how it's dual purposed, either you lay a trap to slow enemies from a distance in order to land that hook easier, or lay it at your feet and use it to make it harder for someone who got hooked to get away. I thought Hog was already kinda perfect, but this is a really nice new tool for him, and his hook still works great. Though them combining his two different fire modes just to do his primary is just the scariest result of the 5v5 power creep this game has gotten. I mean just look at this shit, it's fucking ridiculous. And that's all the heroes I wanted to talk about. But you may have noticed I neglected a particular group of heroes. The ones who were actually introduced into Overwatch 2. 
Now, these aren't the classics I'm quite used to, so what do we think about the newest additions to the Overwatch cast? At first, I was a little bit adverse to playing the new guys and mainly just stuck to the older characters just out of familiarity, but I've really warmed up to them. There's only one I really even slightly dislike, that being Kiriko. Which is funny, because it's not even for the reason everyone else hates her for, being her little get-out-of-jail-free card ability. No, honestly, it's just because as a healer, her healing just feels kind of unsatisfying. I don't really get much tactile feedback when I'm throwing her cards at people. Onto the newcomers I really like, though. Let's start with the one I knew I like right off the bat, Junker Queen. She's kind of like a diet roadhog. She regens her health with attacks that cause bleed, one of which yoinks the enemies into you if it hits. And with that regen, she can just live forever in the middle of crazy team fights. Pulling people into her E never gets old. And if you can find the perfect time to run in, you can just tear enemy teams apart. Truly the brawliest brawler to ever brawl. But another newbie I didn't expect to fall in love with, and did, was of all characters, Lifeweaver. At first I just found him kind of awkward and weird to use, but I love the utility he offers. The great range on his heels and the output of them actually being really damn good. His pedal ability is amazing for Han Demand High Ground, not just to stay safe from enemy flankers, but to get those angles on heals other supports could only dream of. As well as having a toolkit that really just encourages you to get creative. Oh, and saving my teammates from certain death with a quick yoink is always fun too. And not to mention, people actually have nice things to say about you when you play a good life weaver. I literally might just keep playing this game just for him. A super fun character. Though, the only thing that really irks me about these newbies and why I kind of avoid them in the first place goes back to the free unlock stuff. It's just the fact that I can't really make them feel like my own, you know? When a new hero dropped in Overwatch 1, it was hype, cause then there was new shit in the loot pool, and you would slowly unlock all their cosmetics, and got to deck them out with just the right skins, and voice lines, and emotes, and all that fun stuff. But Overwatch 2 for some reason really skims on giving the new guys, like, anything to start out with. We used to live in a world where upon release, characters would receive at minimum 10 skins, 3 highlight intros, 25 sprays, and 25 voice lines. But now the standard for a new character is like what? 4 blues, 3 emotes, and maybe 10 sprays and voice lines? And since they stopped the tradition of event sprays and emotes, every new character just feels so lacking in choices compared to the characters who have been around since Overwatch 1. Though, there's one thing that hasn't changed even a bit about this game, and that of course, is its truly wonderful player base. I will be first to admit, I enjoy smearing a bit of mud in the comms from time to time, but god Damn, you can just fucking tell nobody's having a good time playing this damn game. People will be at your throat over the tiniest things, and they'll treat you like fucking garbage if you even slightly fuck up. It's as if nothing's changed. And, you know, there's a bunch of other little things I could get into, like how weird play of the games are now. In a match, you could have a fucking glorious team wipe on point that saves the game, kills the entirety of the enemy team, and makes Mercy be my girlfriend in real life. And then the play of the game is just this. <laughs> what? <laughs> what was that widow play, dude? Also, just how weirdly shit the voice lines are now. They're just kind of weird and long winded. Gods are mere tools, built to foster fear and wielded by the wicked. Like, who would use these? But just to wrap up my thoughts in an already scattered video, in the end, I think the worst part about Overwatch 2 is that I don't even completely hate it. The core, fun experience of a solid hero shooter is still there. It's just 
baffling, unprecedented even, never before seen outside the likes of Sonic Team, how far the bag has been fumbled. But it's so weird too, because even though I made it perfectly clear I think this game is in a pretty bad spot, I still play it relatively regularly, and I still manage to have a ton of fun despite its issues. I think it just goes to show that even if the shell surrounding a game is truly rotten, as long as its foundation is solid, people can and will stick around with it. It's funny too, because as a kid I always joked about how Overwatch had amazing shooter characters trapped in a really shitty game, but it's literally just what the game is now. I mean, of course it's mostly fun, but it isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes I'll have a truly shit Overwatch session that makes me question why I even bothered getting on my computer that day. But let's be real, that's pretty par for the course with most multiplayer games. So, do I recommend you play Overwatch 2? either as someone like me who's played the original and is thinking of coming back, or a newcomer looking to give it a chance. I mean, I guess? At its core, it's a fun game, I stand by that, and I've heard horror stories of the state this game used to be in before I decided to log on, so I guess it's not the worst playable state it's ever been in, but with how far the game has fallen, I don't feel super comfortable seriously recommending it to really anyone. It's definitely got that something special to it that managed to suck me back in, but I'm not really sure it's worth all the hassle. As to the future of Overwatch 2, apparently this game is in an upswing, so maybe things will get better? I've heard rumblings of them maybe trying out 6v6 again, and though completely unlikely, maybe they'll eventually get a little less awful with their monetary practices. <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen with Activision running the show. Though Overwatch 2 might be getting some, like, actual serious competition soon with Marvel Rivals. I think it looks genuinely really fun, and people who've played it seem to agree. So I'm interested to see if Blizzard will finally get off their ass and try a little harder when there's another substantial hero shooter on the market that doesn't keel over within <laughs> two weeks. Ah, heart attack! In conclusion, though I wish I could say I wasn't surprised, five years later, Overwatch is in an even worse state than how I left it, but it's not as bad as I honestly thought it would be. Still bad, but not as bad. With a little bit of work, maybe they could turn this around. And now that I'm back, despite its poor state, I find myself stuck to it again. But that's how it's always been, hasn't it? Overwatch has always been an objectively flawed game, sometimes even downright bad, but it's always been a game just for me. Dun, da, da, dun, da, dun, dun.